Welcome everybody to the Confluence Podcast hosted by Confluence Outfitters. And as always, Confluence Outfitters is not responsible for the content, opinions, or language of the hosts. I am your host, Steve Scott. I'm here with my co-host, fly fishing guide extraordinaire, Luke Powerbait Garrity. Luke, how are you doing, buddy? Uh, yeah, my rumor proceed, my, the rumor precedes me, apparently. <laughs> uh, the reputation, no, the rumor. Uh, doing good, man. Uh, I feel like we should just note that if uh, we do say anything crazy, even though you say that uh, Confluence is not responsible, they'll probably be responsible. <laughs> I What's not happening? <laughs> you're, you're probably right, but you know we're uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we're just talking. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're just it, yeah, uh, yeah. Dude, yeah, so we haven't recorded a podcast since August when you came down, and it, hey, for you listeners, if this is the first one, welcome to the show, um, but uh, if you want to listen to our last one, Steve and I were on the river, we did an on the river, on the water episode, uh, where were we at again, was it was it the Rogue, I can't remember. I, I think it was the American River, or... Uh, American River? <laughs> uh, we, no, we, uh, we found a nice shady spot right underneath the Sundial Bridge on the Sacramento yeah. River. We had an epic day of fishing that day. Yeah, it's my life, man. It's real rough. It's real yeah. rough life. <laughs> it's harsh, especially when the fish eat on every drift. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty fun. So our last episode, we were on the river uh, today. You have you've built a little studio there. I see, like, all these fly fishing nerd things, uh, yeah. logos. Are you sponsored? Is Sims giving you money? Is that what's happening here? I'm not, but uh, my wife just. But went, you would, yeah. You'd receive it though if they, yeah, if they, yeah, if, they if they offered, I totally take it up. No, my wife went through uh, the closet and was like, "You have a bunch of fly fishing stuff that I've just collected over the years," and I was like, "Yeah, I know." Yeah. And then I came home from a trip one day and it was all hanging up. I was like, "That looks really good." So if you got a lot of stuff that you've acquired over the years that looks really cool, just leave it in the closet. Eventually, I've learned your wife will just get tired of it being in the closet wow. space, and they'll hang. She'll hang it up. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool, man. When she listens uh, to my wife, and be mad at me. My wife would not do that. My wife would just <laughs> throw it away. Um, so well done. Uh, yeah, I, I'm in Southern California uh, visiting my daughter in college. So I've been off the river for two whole days, and it's been really good to see my daughter. But I'm also wondering what's going on on that river right now. You just got to text DJ up, and he'll he'll send you like four yeah. pictures. That's yeah, true. He probably will. He'll rub it in my face. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, dude, what, what have you, I know. So steelhead season has started for both of us. I'm also in the middle of kind of an egg bite on the lower sack. Um, salmon returns have been pretty low, which we can talk about in a minute, but, uh, where else have you been fishing? What have you been doing, man? Dude, I've just been beating up the upper rogue. Um, and kind of like down there, you know, the, we've had salmon on the reds all month, but it's been, it's been tough. The egg bite never really turned on for me. Um, and speaking with other guys that guide the river, they all kind of agree. It's just been, it's been hard. So while we've been catching fish, mm. we've been putting in a lot of effort for the fish that we've been getting. So, yeah. um, you know, we were so, bringing them. So down. let me, let's go ahead. Uh, I'm curious, like why, so there are salmon on reds and is it just, they're not dropping eggs yet or, there's no, no they're, steelhead they're, around or your size 52 beads uh, pinned seven feet above the hook. Yeah. Is that <laughs> 52 beads? Um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. The, the egg bite just hasn't been what it has in the last, what it was last year, so to speak. We've uh, mm. I still run them. I still catch fish on them, but it just hasn't been consistent to where I run it all day long like I did last year. Yeah. Uh, we're switching it out. Um, when when we are coming up on the reds, I'll, I will switch it out to an egg. Um, and it's it's been kind of hit or miss. Um, mm. Had good fish come on the egg, but we've also had days where the fish did not bite an egg at all. So it's uh, trying to dial them in right now. It's been a little rough. Um, I'm getting a lot of hits on the lead fly, which is just a big size four stone fly. Um, a lot of hits on that compared to you know when mm -hmm. you're running a global through there so it's been uh it's been interesting trying to trying to get them dialed yeah. in but but they're coming wow. it's just hard work. yeah so you so you've been basically just guiding a bunch on the rogue that's it man the rogue. Yeah. um yeah 
Yeah, that's really the only only place I'm at. So, but we're uh, looking forward to next year. Come down to the to the Klamath and run some trips. And I'm going to work on the uh, main stem of the Umqua. Hopefully, coming up this winter. Awesome. Well, so, but cool. you got to yeah, because you're is that what January? Um, that'll really turn on. The main stem will really turn on in February. Oh, February. Okay. Cool. So yeah, yeah. But you've had some adventures as of late. You went to uh, Montana. You went up to Alaska. Yeah, I did. Tell us yeah, about I've that. been. I yeah. So I went to Montana. I think it was like the third week of August. It was pretty cool. Uh, my my buddy Jason and I uh, drove over there, and uh, we stayed in Dillon. We camped over there and just fished a bunch of local rivers, and then. The confluence guide, Mike Wright, who guides on the Fall River, um, does walk and wade trips all around there, does the Lower Sac, the Trinity. He uh, was dropping off his son at college, and so he came and fished with us for a few days. That was really cool. So we had, you know, two people fishing at all times and all took turns rowing. And the fishing actually was not great in Montana at the time we were there. It was kind of like their dog days. Uh, it was pretty funny. We went into a, the frontier angler, a fly fishing shop. The, I mean, I think it's the fly shop in Dillon. It's pretty, pretty great shop. And just were like, Hey, where can we go and throw a, you know, a chubby Chernobyl all day? And they're like, um, and it took a while to figure the, the out some places. Just, it was just not happening. You know, like we fished the beaver head in, uh, the first day, uh, Jason and I just went and found a riffle or two. We actually caught a bunch of fish. Uh, there was a hatch going on, and we did real well. But the next day, um, we went with a, a guide I know um, over there, and pretty slow, it was pretty tough to scratch out fish. Um, but we ended up doing the, the Yellowstone below Livingston, which mm-hmm. I'd never fished. I'd never floated. Big water, beautiful water. Do dry flies all day. I uh, got to do that. and Yeah, so then I came back. I think I guided for about two and a half weeks uh, in California, and then I flew to Alaska for 10 days and caught 7 billion fish. Um, just, yeah, I was stupid. I, I actually, it was like, I'm pretty sure most days I was hooking over 150 fish. I'm almost positive. And on the last day, I was like, all right, I'm just going to keep track. I'm going to see what happens. And we were doing like a, four hour float, just kind of a half day thing. I probably fished about three hours of it and I stopped counting at 59. It was like, okay, this is ridiculous. So those are good, the good problems to have. Tough day. I mean, yeah. tough day. Then I came back to the lower sack. I've been on the lower sack for the last, uh, the four weeks, a lot done some Trinity trips for the steelhead. Um, yeah, I got to fish, uh, with Dylan Woodrum, who we had on an episode from Flam Face, yes. and I took him and his wife and their son last week on the lower sack for one day and we pillaged and then we went to the Trinity and we, we ended up hooking four adults. So that was, that was cool. Landed four adults. I should say we actually landed them too. So it was even better sure. than your typical steelhead trip, but yeah, so that's been what I've been up to just kind of grinding out the days. I took, uh, four days off this week and that was really nice my hands were permanently locked in in ore mode <laughs> so, <laughs> dreaming about rigging beads and bobbers so yeah. yeah so today we're gonna get into uh how to read water for the folks that are just uh getting into fly fishing or maybe you're on that uh novice slash intermediate threshold and you want to get better at reading water so we're gonna kind of delve into that um, yeah, so this will be, uh, this will be interesting. Cause you can, you can talk to probably seven different guys that fish and have seven different answers as to what they attack first when it comes to a piece yeah. of water. So, um, if you want to send us hate mail on this, understand, uh, like Luke said earlier in the show, we don't care. Um, this is how we <laughs> approach fish fishing. This is how we approach, uh, a piece yeah. of water and there's nine different ways to skin a cat. There's a hundred different ways to approach water. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll get into it and uh, we'll tell you and, what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And I think also too, something that's interesting is every river system seems to have its own little characteristics, right? I mean, like on the, I always use the lower sack as a perfect example of this because I am joking, but not really when I tell people that lower sack rainbows 
are big and they're great when you hook them, but overall they're pretty lazy. Like they're not going to chase much. Um, they're just going to be chilling, you know? So you, so you have to find where they hang out and, you know, like when you go to Montana, you're throwing in Colorado and a lot of rivers, you're throwing against the bank, right? I mean, when I was fishing with you, we were throwing against the bank quite a bit on the rogue, even um, lower sack trout. It's the opposite. Like throw out to the middle of the river is generally where yeah. they're going to be at. Yeah. So, I mean, I think reading water. Yeah. It's, that's a great, great topic. Uh, so I'm going to, um, I'm not teasing you. I'm asking for real. Okay. Yeah. So you, you went to guide school. You actually got training. Yeah, yes. you like know things. <laughs> you, you know terms of things that I just kind of know how to do. Uh, is that one of the things that you learned uh, was reading reading water? It was. Um, so I went to the Sweetwater Travel Guide School, and that was uh, – I've done two guide schools, actually. I did their basic and their advanced, and the basic was Ooh. on the – <laughs> <laughs> so it's so professional <laughs> and then the advanced we uh we fished the yellowstone outside of big timber down mm. by the living area where you were at uh yeah. really cool area to fish but part of that is is breaking down where fish hold um mm. and but like everything else fish are going to be where you find them right it's kind of like elk hunting like where are the elk at the elk are where you find them same thing with with fishing mm. there's gonna be areas that you concentrate on and that's going to be the seams that's going to be the foam lines um, but you know, especially well, let's, to- let's, let's, let's slow it down. Uh, let's back up. So for the person who's like, maybe never, ever been on a river or is going on a drift boat trip for the first time, you, you said seams, like what is a seam? Start explain that to people. I mean, you'll, it, it, it's a current seam. It's kind of where the, where the faster current and the slower current meet up. And that's a mm. tradition. It's a, it's like a feeding lane. The, the fish will kind of hang out in that in that water in that area. And, uh, that's where you want to drift your flies. Cause that's where the food's going to be. And the fish will dart in there, mm-hmm. dart out. Hopefully they, they grab your fly and that indicator goes down or the, uh, you know, you see the take on the top, but that's where the fish are going to hang out. And that's where you want to target those. Um, now that being said, you can toss into back eddies and get smolts, you know, the, the smaller fish, those are fun. But when you approach the water, you're the first thing I look for is the seam line. I want to, concentrate mm-hmm. on those things. Um, and then after that, you start looking at other structure in the river, boulders, uh, shoals, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on the rogue up here, we're not, uh, it's not a traditional like freestone type river. There's a lot of big structure in this river. So it's, it's also a little different because I look for the bigger boulders. I look for slots in the rock formations and that's where the steelhead mm-hmm. hang out. That's where I'm going to concentrate putting my flies but like you were saying well, and the rogue yeah the rogue is similar to i think it's similar to the trinity it's it's technically a tailwater right it, there is a dam and they yeah. are controlling but i think the trinity and the rogue both have a lot of characteristics of a freestone i mean they they have a lot of the the same types of water even though they're temp you know they're uh, flow controlled is that pretty accurate yeah I, I i'd say that um yeah i'll agree with that Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I always think like, you know, for our, for my primary two rivers, I fish the lower sack and the Trinity, they're both tailwaters, but they are totally different. The Trinity is, you know, very, very, I mean, it can almost look like the upper sack, uh, you know, or a traditional freestone with, you know, rocks and ripples. And, but I think that's kind of a, um, a, a good maybe thing to first talk about, you know, so like, there's reading water from a boat and then there's reading water for shore, right? They're like mm-hmm. a lot of people come to our rivers um, and they'll oftentimes ask like, Hey, you know, can I, are there any places I can wait at here and fish? And, you know, it just, uh, for the lower sack, it all depends on flows, right? If it's, if it's raging at 10 to 15,000 CFS, it's going to be really hard to find safe locations to get in at when it's low as it is right now, it's, there's like tons of locations, but like if I was walking and waiting, I'm going to probably fish a little, like I'm going to probably look for things differently than I would if I was in my drift boat. I'm um, assuming you do the same thing. So like you talked about seams. Um, so looking for locations between faster water and slower water. So you're talking about like that water rate where the two kind of meet. That's yep. one spot that fish will hold. What are some other spots that you, you kind of find actually tell me every secret you have. That's what I really <laughs> okay. want. All right. Um, I like, I just dropped my rain jacket. I was drying off from yesterday. Um, I like tailouts and that's where that, you know, the, the water coming in 
to the end of a riffle where it gets a little bit faster fish come up there they'll go through that riff or that rapid and they'll hang out in that tail out kind of recoup a little bit i've had luck throughout tail outs um river mm -hmm. left or right in the middle i love fishing tail outs from a boat it can be kind of difficult to fish because you don't get a chance to target mm -hmm. it more than once but when i'm fishing from the bank especially on the north umqua i hammer tail outs uh fish mm -hmm. love Another place that I look for fish is going to be um, any big boulder. And you can see the boil in the river. You can see the water actually going up over that, that boulder. I like to fish all four corners of that, either side of it mm -hmm. and then um, in front of it. But keeping in mind that you're probably going to hang up if you don't hit a fish. But in front of that mm -hmm. boulder, you'll get a soft pillow of water and fish like to hold in that. And then definitely behind that, toss it, toss that indicator. I like to toss that indicator for the middle of that boulder. By the time the flies hit, it's into that little boily water and it's coming out. Yeah. Lots of fish um, have been caught out of that. Yeah. Yeah. You got the scene. So you talked about, you talked yeah. about holding, holding there, I think, you know, so um, the reason why trout will be sitting in a tail out since, you know, for those of you who maybe are like unfamiliar with some of this terminology, you can seriously Google tail out, uh, pr probably, tri you know, tail out Trinity water and you'll be able to find, um, find the information about that but uh they they hang out there right it's holding water they've gone through faster water they kind of like to rest in the tail out oftentimes uh but then also around boulders you're saying they're going to be in front of them on the sides of them and behind them and again the reason why is because food 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 is coming to them right it's moving water um it's also gives them a little relief from having to like burn all their energy right because i think most trout i could say a lower sack of the you know the laziest fish out there but it, they're pretty lazy everywhere i mean they like to they're not going to exert too much energy right because that's kind of how you survive so i think one of the things that i remember um learning i felt like later on is in front of those rocks like you're saying how you kind of think that the trout are going to always be behind the rock because it gives them gives them a little pause from gives them rest but the mm -hmm. same thing is happening in front of the rock too right because the current actually is it's it's um, slows down and the water hydraulics gives right in front of a rock a good resting place for a trout so oftentimes there's a trout sitting right there so that's why you're going to always try to hit you said the front both sides and back right yep 100 percent. and cool. it's for those same reasons cool. it's fisher everybody likes to think you know fisher i don't really know how to word it fish are lazy um they're so they're gonna they're gonna go in the water that they expend the least amount of energy especially when they're holding. Now, when they're moving up, salmon, steelhead specifically, uh, or even the, even the big bull trout in the Metolius in central Oregon, when they're moving up from Lake Billy Chinook into the river to spawn, they're going to move, and oftentimes they'll, they'll move quick. But mm -hmm. they're always going to seek out that slower water because they need the rest. They want to be lazy. They don't want to have to expend that energy. So any place where there's a, a readily available food source where they can rest, dart in, dart back out after grabbing that bug that floats by that's what they're going to look for and that's mm. as, that's what we need to concentrate on because we want to give the best presentation yeah. we can in order to get the Makes fish sense. yeah so with the definitely the boulders definitely the seam lines um i like to I target think too, go ahead uh, i'll just say one thing too is is we're kind of going in and out between uh, migratory steelhead, you know, rainbow trout that live out in the ocean. And perhaps maybe you can add the same thing to like brown trout that are, that are migratory, um, you know, go out to the ocean and come up, but that's a little bit different than trout trout that are native too. Right. Because um, with steelhead, they're going to be moving through. And so you mentioned like sometimes they'll be shooting through like a real fast run, exerting mm -hmm. a bunch of energy. And then they get out to that next, the tail out of the next pool and they'll just kind of be chilling right there relaxing, getting their energy back, resting, whatever, whatever it is that they're doing. I don't have a meeting, um, but so there's, so, I mean, well, like, like steelhead, I think that's one of the things that's interesting about steelhead or salmon is that you could, you know, not, you know, I don't would say fish everything, but you have the, it's potentially possible that you could hook fish kind of in any type of water. Cause they have to go through that water at some point in time. Whereas with native trout, like you're trying to find holding spots where they, tend to congregate and you know pot up sometimes even on some rivers yeah no yeah absolutely and i'll uh, i'll probably let you get into that because you fish trout water a lot more than i do whereas i'm i'm kind of concentrating on the steelhead with the exception of the salmon fly hatch which is just mm -hmm. 
ridiculous doing that. Yeah. We, we did everything, but with the uh, with the trout on like the lower sack or some of the other rivers you fished, um, what kind of what kind of water are you specifically? Are you are you fishing everything? Or are you just fishing a hole and then okay, we're going to push on to the next hole and you're going to pass that faster water? Yeah. Man, why are your dogs so angry? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I, I don't know, dude. He is upset right now. So we'll just let him. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's upset that you're not talking more about steelhead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think fishing, I mean, I think that's kind of the whole, I don't think it's a guide thing. I think anybody who's into fishing is going to try to figure out where the fish are on a regular basis, right? So, yeah. uh, again, every system, seem, every river system seems to have certain spots. I mean, there's spots like, and you fish with me a little bit uh, to know, like I, there's spots where I'm like, we're going to get a fish here. It's going to happen. You know, it's like, they just, hang, this is where they are. And then there's other times, you know, they might not be eating too. But doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, but what I think is really fascinating about uh, trout, um, especially fish that are revolving around hatches is that like, if you have certain hatches of bugs, I'm thinking particularly caddis, fish will move from deeper water into the shallower riffly water just to eat. And you'll catch fish that like you could have fished that run earlier in the daytime, you know, for three hours and not hooked a single fish likely because there might not have been one there. Um, but then later on in the day when there's this huge hatch going on, they all move into it. I remember when we were fishing, there's that one riffle that I took you to that's kind of shallow, but there were tons of fish in there because they were feeding on, you know, various uh, bug bugs are popping off too so part of the whole reading water is also why you somewhat have to uh work hard to not only know read the water but also kind of know what's happening with the bug activity or the food sources too right because there's certain certain spots that seem to have more potential i mean i'm thinking of streamers like there's there's certain water that throwing a streamer in is really pretty good you know for certain species like brown trout because they eat stuff there you know yeah, one hundred percent. I don't know, man. The, the trout thing to me is kind of unique because I concentrate so much on the migratory fish. So when I was fishing with you, it was kind of cool because we you were. You're right that that area. You were like, we're not going to fish that to later. You said that this morning. That, that, that morning, you're like, we're not going to. This is going to be later when the hatches come off. Mm-hmm. So we bypassed that water, and then the hatch started, and we went over there, and you got me into a handful of fish. Um, mm-hmm. And in regards to to strip and streamers, uh, you know, I haven't done a lot of that. Did a, did a bit of it in Montana last summer, but, but it was just, it was the deeper holes, uh, where there's lots of cover, cut mm-hmm. banks like that rock. Yeah, walls. yeah. You can strip some meat through there and you can absolutely hammer the big predatory fish. And we, I caught a handful of Browns over 20 inches in the Yellowstone doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we yeah. were also fishing those, the hopper droppers in areas where traditionally you're not going to, you're not going to target fish, um, real shallow water. Like you said, and we caught a, a 26 inch brown trout doing that in like a foot and a half of water, um, mm-hmm. off of a bar. So, uh, you can, that's why I say you can approach different water, different ways, and it's always going to work. As long as you do it the right time, you approach it in an educated fashion and you can target mm-hmm. the, as long as, like you said, you're targeting, the the food sources if there's a hatch coming off um and you know where those fish are going to be you're going to have some luck and if nothing's going off then you hit the seams you hit the boulders you look for structure i love fishing structure yeah. it's kind of like uh hmm. I, I call it bill dancing it right you're gonna like bill dance always targets the bass underneath the underneath the repairing zone over yeah yeah like logs mm-hmm. um same thing with trout same thing with steelhead yeah it looks like a champ yeah but I think like if we, so thinking about um, breaking down uh, r- rivers, you know, you like, I, I think the traditional, and by the way, uh, I wanted to recommend um, one book for sure. Um, Tom Rosenbauer from Orvis has uh, the Orvis guide to reading trout streams. Really great book for people getting into uh, fly fishing because it does exactly what we're talking about and has charts and cool things. And then I think um, Dave Hughes's book, Reading Trout Water, is also another great book, you know, for anybody who wants to actually spend some time thinking about that. But when you look at a, a section of the river, you know, like we're talking about riffles, which are shallower, there's rocks that, that the surface is disturbed, it's riffly. Um, then you have runs, which are the deeper waters with, you know, kind of, it's kind of smooth, 
Um, but it's moving at, I think for steelhead guys, we generally like, if we see a run that's like, w- like faster walking speed or you know, about that walking speed deeper. Oh man. I mean, I know how we, we're like, Oh man, we used to eight feet deep a little bit faster than walking. Dude, speed. Really? Yeah. Expensive. We are just, we get like nuts. So yeah. But then you've got eddies and I think, so the squirrels, right? Like, um, and I think for years, I never fished eddies. I just oh, would see the squirrels and I was like, ah, oh, get out of here. There's no trout hanging out there. But I've since found those are some of the best spots to almost get a grab. I mean, almost all the time because uh, it feels like what my observation on the lower sack is I think that there's trout in the squirrels, um, mm-hmm. especially the big like what we call salmon water, you know, it's real swirly. Yeah, I will, I'll get fish in them this summer on caddis all the time. And I think it's because those caddis are, you know, they're, I mean, caddis move around, you know, it seems like those caddis will cause those, uh, those fish to eat in really weird eddy locations. Um, pools really good. And then tailouts, right? So ripples, runs, eddies, pools, and tailouts. Those all, you can, you can learn to read them. And each one of those locations on a river will have trout holding in them due to certain different at certain different times and in certain different ways. So that's, that's kind of helpful. So I, but I think those two books, I mean, did you, have you ever read any books on? I've, I've read, holding? I've read both Hughes and Rosenbauer's and then, um, yeah. Orvis has their fly fishing com website and that mm-hmm. breaks down everything fly fishing related. And when I first got into fly fishing, I spent a lot of time, excuse me, I spent a lot of time watching those videos and they do a very good job of breaking down mm. how to read water um how to how to present the fly to catch more fish they do so i I, in addition to the two books that you recommended i recommend that um that website fly fishing 101 i think you know it seems like too another thing that's connected to how to read water that i always want to it's like i can't tell me times i'm sitting there watching people walk out to the river and then they get to the river and what they do is they unhook their their fly strip off some line and then they just jump into the water and wait out until it's up to their freaking, you know, chest. And then they start heaving casts. And I'm just like, I mean, you know, you, you, I know you feel the yeah. same where it's like, dude, you're standing on the fish. Uh, you, you, you know, so I, there's a ton of old school fly fishing, um, you know, people who used to always say, Hey, you know, fish the water right in front of you. You know, and that's, I mean, I remember learning that the hard way I was fishing in Colorado on this, like, I don't know, you know, gold medal, trout fishery and i i didn't i knew the new best not to just jump in the river like i had known that you know but i like stripped off some line i had this little elk hair caddis on and i literally just did one of those like you know when you throw the line out just a little bit to get ready to make a cast a little further out i did it and right when i lifted my fly up out of the depths of this you know maybe a foot and a half so it wasn't very deep i watched this like 22 inch cutty just come right up and it tried to eat my caddis as i lifted it off to catch further and i was like no (laughs) you know so so when you're reading water i think the thing you have to also realize is it's not just like deep water i guess that's kind of my point in mentioning that they'll move into ripples is that you can catch fish in um really shallow water last year kevin k another confluence guide and i were fishing on the sack and i was telling him about this like shallow why it was like yeah i'd hook some fish in the shallow water i mean it was like i'm talking like three or four inches you know, and I was like, yeah, throw it over there. And he made a cast. I think he was using a dry fly. And like instantaneously, like this 20 plus inch fish just chowed, you know, and he was like, oh man, you know, we were both like, gosh, that was like not even deep enough for the fish to <laughs> hang out in, you know? So, yeah. So reading water. Yeah. And it's a skill and a art. It, it is. And you bring up a good point with guys just crashing out into the river fish pick up on noise so if you just go crashing out into the river because you see a good piece you see a good seam out there and you're like that's what i'm gonna that's what i'm gonna do you can't just go crash out into the river if you're waiting you you gotta you gotta move slow fish are spooky but there's a lot to be said for fishing close as well work your way out to that seam your fish mm-hmm. hold all throughout there and it's not they're not gonna be towed fish right they're, they're gonna be smaller fish but it helps build your confidence, especially if you're new to the fly fishing game. Catching fish will build your confidence. So if you approach it slow, you work your way out, and you don't, just don't go mm-hmm. splat through. Wait up to your knees and then just, just work the water, like you said, right in front of you, and then eventually work out to that seam or that structure that you find that you really yeah. like. 
that'll help you. One, you're not going to be bombing casts out there with, you know, unable to mend it and all that. You're going to be able to warm up if that makes sense. It's kind of like when you, when you go to yeah. play a game, you got to warm up. Same thing with fly fishing, fish it close, warm up. And then when you hit that nice piece of water, you want, you're already in the zone and you're making yeah. less mistakes. So definitely yeah. do that as well. Yeah. And also too, I think another part of that is, um, you know, with the whole idea of, of working out, um, you know, you, you just are less likely to line fish too, I think, you know, cause there are mm-hmm. fisheries that the fish are way spookier. Right. And so if you throw a bunch of casts out there and you skip the stuff closer, when you come back in to maybe, Oh yeah, I should fish closer. Um, you know, after you've cast a bunch over them, some, some spots, you know, some rivers, those fish will be once you line them, meaning once you've cast your fly line over them and they see that shadow game over, you might as well pack up and, and leave, you know? So I, I, yeah, I love the idea of what you're saying is just working out, starting in close and working your way out. You get better. You're getting your castings kind of getting dialed in. If it's been a while, you're also not going to spook the fish. Um, you know, it's so a working out to structure or the riffle or the whatever it is, is a really good idea. It's, that's great. Good insight. Um, so you basically you went to guide schools and they taught you everything you need to know about rivers. So when you look at a river, you just, I mean, is it to the point where you're kind of, and I'm kind of obviously being facetious because you're on the river a lot too. So I know that that's also <laughs> from that, but I got to troll you about your guide school, bro. Um, <laughs> but when you look at a piece of water, you now can, I'm assuming can kind of generally say, Hey, that's a, that's a really good spot right there. That's a holding spot. This spot right here, less, less, less likely to hold fish. Is that kind of how you approach breaking it down? Yes. Yeah. And it, uh, that guide school is a, is a good rowing school too. You're in the drift boat every day. So that really Hmm. helped me out when approaching different runs from the rower seat versus from the bank. Now, not to be said, there were a lot of times that we'd, we'd pull the boat over, drop the anchor, we'd get out and we'd, we'd wade fish as well, but definitely I I look for, I key in on color changes. That's the biggest, the biggest thing. Um, I Mm, want drops, drops. Yeah. Yeah, Talk about that. What do you mean by color change? So you get the, you get shallow water. It's got the rock on it. That's going to be like a brown or tannish color water. And then you'll see it as it comes out. I I call it a shoal um, where it shoals out into that deep green, emerald green. I call it steelhead green water that's where I like to concentrate my flies going fresh into a run that I may have never seen before that I know fish are going to hold on because the water's a bit more oxygenated coming through the riffle back into that deeper stuff. Um, it's a great ambush point for fish to hang out and wait for food to come off that. So I concentrate on that first. Um, after that, you know, aside from the, the wide classic steelhead runs that you and I were just talking about, I like shoals going, the brown shoals going into a deep green color change. After that, if there's not that, I'm looking for structure anywhere in the river and anywhere in the water column. So it could be the width mm. of the river, any depth, I'm going to look for that structure, whether that's logs, that's rocks. Um, I like the the rocks up by the surface because it creates that pillow that's easier for me to target. And it's also easier for me to get my anglers into. Mm-hmm. And then I'll look for the down trees. And then after that, then I'll start concentrating on cut banks, riparian zone structure, stuff like that. So that's how I approach a run um, mm. that, I, that I'm coming into on a river that I've never seen. Now on the road, like it is for you on the on the lower sack, we've been on it day in and day out for a long time. So we just we've keyed in on yeah this this doesn't really hold a lot of fish, but down here on the right, yeah, that's going to hold yeah. fish. Yeah. But that's how I break that down. And guide school was real good about looking for the color changes, looking for the structure, looking mm. for the long, deep runs. And yeah. like we were talking about, I love, I love eddies, um, especially stripping a streamer through eddies. I absolutely love that. That's a great way mm. to target big predatory fish. Mm. Um, but they're big predatory fish, so they're they're few and far between. But when they're there, it's 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 pretty epic. Yeah, I, I think you bring up some of the kind of. <laughs> It related to not just fishing, but I think guiding, but also fishing. Um, you mentioned like, so you're on a river <clears throat> enough to where you're like, yeah, this spot right here, it could hold fish, but there's much better spots or, Hey, we're going to back row some spots. Cause I find myself like there's certain clients I was giving them a hard time. Cause they're like, they'll be like, Oh, wh- what about that spot? And I, I want to, uh, you know, like, Oh no, 
like I'm, I'm, I don't want to go fish over there because there's so many big fish to catch. And I just don't want to take you over there. It's like, no, if it was good, I'd, you know, be over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, had, like, uh, oh, yeah I, say, I, I had something similar um, a while back where the, the deepest part of the river in that section is dead center of the river and there's mm-hmm. rocks, there's everything. And everywhere else, it just, the, the way the river is, it's just, gradual from left and right bank and then deepest part of the river you want to know where i find steelhead is in that deepest part of the river so i'm on the i'm on the river right bank, uh side and i'm telling him cast left 10 to 15 feet get a mend in and my client looks back at me he's like do you really find fish in the middle of the river i was like yeah yes dave and we're gonna call him dave <laughs> Like, yeah. yeah, Dave, that's that's where I find fish. That's why I'm having you fish. Yeah. If there if it Yeah. Well it's so, always funny because it's like, I mean, I really believe this about most well, I mean, all the guides I know, we want you to catch fish more than you want to catch fish. Like we want you to walk away from this day like, dude, we pillaged or we did we we got them, you know, we worked hard whatever it is, you know, some days are, it's going to be tough, but you like put in your, like, I want my folks to go home. Like that was an awesome trip. I mean, I know you're the same way. So it's like, obviously we're going to fish the water that like, or at least I don't, I'm like, I'm always like, Hey, this is not like a, a guide sorcery spot where I'm just going to have you cast over there to kill some time. Like I don't do that. I would much rather back row the juicy good water mm-hmm. and skip the water. That's not really productive. Most of the time. It's not that that water can't hold trout, but again, it's like we have eight hours today. Let's spend, you know, as much of that time fishing the more productive water. It's always funny because again, and I get it. Like when I go to new fisheries, I'm like, you know, you're like, you're like, it's all mystery, right? It's like, oh, but yeah. what about over there? You know, like, cause we all have these stories too, where we went and explored something that we never thought we'd catch a fish in. And we, we hooked some crazy, crazy fish in, you know, but like right now on the lower sack, um, which I, I think it sounds like, rogues kind of similar in some ways we have had uh, easily one of the worst well the worst salmon return i've ever seen i mean and i've not been out here for you know decades so all the guys that have been here for decades who are saying this is the worst one they've seen in 25 plus years i take that seriously so it's really interesting because generally in october i mean the egg bites why people come and that's why we can do 31 days of guiding if we were crazy enough you know to do it um, but the salmon weren't here and it was really interesting. And I was on, on the river, um, this is probably two weeks ago now. And I had this husband and wife and like, I took the, I took the egg stuff off. It was, it was clearly not happening. You took the beads off. I was like, let's say, I know I'm a, I, as much as I like, think it's the best fly ever because I'm a, the last what's the date today. I'm going to write this you, down. Yeah, do it. Yeah. You spay guys, you know, <laughs> are so happy with not catching fish. I'm the opposite. So anyway, um, I, I take it off because I was finding it was like almost turning the fish off. Like it, it was like almost like kryptonite because the, I think the trout were like, there's no salmon in here. Why would we eat that? You know? So I took it off and I went to a bunch of bugs um, and we started smashing fish. I mean, but it was hilarious because like a couple of guides who are not local guides, they're, you know, guys that come up and just fish that season they were like talking to me and they're like, Oh dude, we were like watching that lady. Just, I mean, like, what were you, they were trying to figure out what color bead I had. That's what they were like. What color bead were you using? <laughs> and so I told them, I, I was like, I wasn't even fishing a bead. They were just like, you know, like, Oh, like it wasn't in their, their playbook. And not because they're bad guys. I don't mean that at all. They just were like, Oh, but October normally is salmon. And they just, you know, were doing the standard. And it was like, yeah, I mean, I think you also have to, change your game on game up again based off of where the trout are so for us they're on the lower sack it's really fascinating there's water that i call trout water that typically holds fish but once the salmon move in and there's a lot of reds they're like trout aren't even there and so you can spend all day back rowing all the stuff that you know the other 10 months out of the year you'd catch five or six fish in Mm -hmm. but right now there's like there's no fish there or they're so keyed in on eggs that they're just not eating anything other than eggs so then it's like your strategy becomes, well, finding salmon, you know, finding salmon reds to find steelhead and trout on, you know? So it like, I feel like find you know, the whole reading water, it's not just learning about a tail out in a riffle in a run, right? It's also about learning what the trout are doing in those specific uh, areas of the river. And also like knowing that 
especially for you with migratory fish. I mean, they're like, you could be fishing a river with no fish in it. Like that is a, that's a steelhead trip. Yes. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's a, that, that's a frustrating day. Dude. Oh, so bad. But it, I it, told Dylan, it, I told it, Dylan on Saturday, this is so funny. Like we're fishing on the Trinity and we had hooked like a few half pounders, but I was pretty sure, like we we did a float, uh, Andrew, own, the owner of Confluence, Andrew and I did this float where we were for sure ahead of all the boats. And we were like, we are prime time. We should, I was, we're going to hook 10. That was, I was like, we're going to do it. We're going to hook 10. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I would have confident. Uh, and then we didn't, we just hooked a couple half pounders, but run after run that's all juicy water. I'm like, we're not hooking anything. And I'm like, man, what's going on? So I literally said, you know, Dylan makes a cast. And I'm like, man, I'm not, I don't know, Dylan. I'm like, it is just not feeling fishy today. I'm like, it is, it's feeling like we might be fishing a freaking empty river. And then like three seconds later, Bobber down, he smacks an adult. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Which was, it was cool. But I was like, what, you know, like that's the crazy, that's the other side of the coin, right? Like you and I could be fishing an empty river or we could be fishing what we think is an empty river, and there's actually a steelhead waiting for you to float a big old. I don't use those big size four rubber legs with multiple colored beads and sparkly. Yeah, crank crinkles lights. and all sorts of stuff. Whatever. Um, no, but I think that in you know for for those of the guys that are listening that are that are new or just getting into it. Reading water is important. Presenting the fly is important, but fishing with confidence day in and day out especially when you're learning that's that's huge um yeah. because you're if you're just getting into fly fishing unless you have the luck of every god ever known to humankind there's a potential to go a very long time without catching a fish mm-hmm. so you have to fish it confidently and as a steelhead guide as a steelhead angler uh before i was a guide I fished confidently and you there there's times you go a very long time without a hookup because you're fishing an empty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just keep that in the back of your head, especially when you, when you fish steelhead, it's uh yeah, there's some hard days to be had out there, but when it's yeah. bobbing down and you're into backing, it makes up for all those days. That's true. Yeah. And it's hey, all- I, you know, one thing I could mention too, uh, just about you and I, um, you know, the way we guide, and I think a lot of other guides too, but I mean, I think that's one of the fun things about taking, I, I take a lot of, I have a lot of, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of repeat clients and those are great. I love doing that, but I also have a fair amount of new people coming in. And a lot of times people who haven't fly fished either at all, or maybe they've done it like one or two times. And so that's part of the, uh, the day, I think, you know, and I know you do that too, where it's like, Hey, we're going to do our best in the lower sack. I mean, the saying we always say is Kevin K has said, um, you got to work pretty hard not to catch fish in the lower sack. And as you saw, that's pretty, pretty accurate assessment, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to, we're going to hook some fish. Um, but, you know, throughout that day, it's also about learn not just learning, you know, it's not just instructional in the sense of casting, but I also think too, telling people and showing people like, why are trout here as we hook them, you know, like, why are we back rowing this section of water? really well you know and it always comes back to obviously oxygenation in the summer especially um but all all the times but then food sources like hey this is a feeding trough you know there is a buffet line of food being just brought to these trout and that's why every time we fish and we hit that drop off like you mentioned earlier that we're hooking a fish every time why because they're there there's probably seven billion of them you know yeah. laughing at us and then one dumb one which will take the dumb one Every yeah, single time. Every, every day. Every day. Well, yeah. when you and Andrew came up and fished with me last December, that day that I fell in the water, and I'm pretty sure there's a picture where all you see are my boots sticking up out of the water. And <laughs> um, <laughs> tempting. Tempting, but I didn't do it, just so you know. The drone was the drone was flying, though. I it was. Know. Yes, it was. But it was, uh, if you remember that bucket, and I called it, you were in front of the boat, and I tell you, okay, we're coming. Oh, you did. And I said, there's going to be a fish in this bucket. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Boom. We landed a fish. Yeah. And I was tempted to pull a move where like, that's when I would like, you know, get my flies in a knot or I'd like hook my shirt, but yeah. I stuck with it. I you listened know. to my guide, made my mend, <laughs> bam. But it's like reading water, looking at that, uh, the buckets too. Um, yeah. You know, in, in the productive areas where you say like, 
we're going to re-row this because it holds fish. You know, I've taken it, it kind of filled in a little bit, so it's easier for me to row back up, whereas before it was almost impossible without a kicker motor. But now I can go all the way to the other side of the river, and that's a pretty big wide part of the river, and I can row back up and then work my way back out and hit that again. And I'm tempted to kind of just, once I get there, jump out and hold the boat. But I think I want you in my boat in case you know, I don't necessarily stick my landing um, cause it <laughs> drops off really quick right there. Yeah. And I'm going to be swimming to shore, but it's, it's that, it's that bucket. It's that shoal drop off going mm-hmm. in that water, small bucket resting place. Yeah. And also above that too, there's, there's three runs back to back that are good where it's river, right? It's a really nice classic run that peters out and then it goes into a tail out and do a much shorter run fast. And I, I call it, it's moving water. The fish aren't going to stick around in there, but fish are always moving up into it. But then that goes into a deep tank and that's traditionally where you'll find salmon. And I don't fish that lower half of the tank, but right where it comes into the upper part of that tank, I hammer that. I, I re-row that mm-hmm. six, eight times before we push out of there. It's deep, but there's fast moving water going into it. And there's hmm. probably, six or seven different visible feeding lanes in there that you can see from the surface so it's just all about hitting that and when you find that on a river you work that because that's you're going to up your odds a lot so Hmm. so basically that's just you again reading water but also through trial and error you've caught fish in certain locations and so now you do it right Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think, well, and probably you too. I mean, you've probably, you know, well, back casts are inevitable for it. You know, you, you let your back cast mm-hmm. in the water and then you go to cast and all of a sudden you rip fish out of the water. Um, and now you yeah. go through that every time you're like, Hey, cast to the right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, it's, it's so funny that that literally happened uh, with one of my trips. I think it was on Wednesday. We were going into a, a set of salmon reds and I'm like, all right, I pulled off. I thought I pulled off to river to the river right a little bit so you could fish off the left with enough space you know Mm -hmm. for the the area and dude makes his back cast and like you know and you fished our river so we do the sacramento fluff the most (laughs) ugly cast of all time but he he like left it over there just enough and it was like you know probably about maybe two feet deep so his egg uh imitation okay uh like literally just you know he got eaten like yeah (laughs) Bead. uh it got eaten like i mean he he would like starts he, i mean it was such a big fish he couldn't even flip you know he just was like ah oh, i got a fish on and i was i was like i'm like that's how good i am we can get him anywhere you know <laughs> clearly just the lower sack being freaking amazing yeah that's that's cool but yeah now so the next day i adjusted and i went into that that run further over to the right so we could get into some into the shallower water and i had one guy out deeper and then one guy closer and both of them again hooked fish you know one of the shallow stuff but exactly what you said like i would never have i wouldn't have done that if we hadn't had this accidental hookup you know mm-hmm. and now it's like yeah through years of trial and error i've developed this location and i know exactly where they are so for those of you who are going to take a guy to trip when your guide says hey yeah you know of years and years of learning this river 50% of that was accidental. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like way more than that, but yeah, yeah so that's a good percentage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, I got one. I got one. Yeah. Then yeah, you're on your phone dropping a pin right here. Yeah. So, so yeah. So for those listening, um, those two books we mentioned, the uh, Dave Hughes, Reading Trout Water, and then the Todd uh, Rosenbauer one from Orvis, the Orvis guy to reading trout streams uh just really great books you know we'll have links to those in the description too so if you're wanting to pick them up on amazon you can do so and and i think those are good places to and then steve mentioned uh the what is it orvis fly fishing 101 uh yeah. website yeah yeah that's a good so resource yeah so i'm curious like what's on the upcoming schedule you've got what's your four what's the weather looking like for the road you guys getting any rain we don't even have any finally have rain in the forecast i'm so excited we got rained on um yesterday i was out on the river and uh just a couple drizzles and the cloud cover wasn't there Mm -hmm. fish were hard to 
come by, but we we brought we we hooked up with some. Um, but uh, today we got a day off from the rain. But the next four or five days, it's we're supposed to get hammered. So I'm excited to get more. Yeah, that's gonna bump that river up, kind of freshen things up, and move some fish around. So mm. I'm super excited for that. But we're getting into November, so November um, bait is allowed to be used on the upper rogue for steelhead starting in November. Oh, you probably get super excited about that. That's like your yeah. favorite time of the year, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I just I can't wait. Um, yeah. You just take your rubber legs and then you put like herrings on them. Yeah, and- I do. I've got a four frozen trays of herring in my freezer, some tuna yeah. boxes <laughs> on those. Um, so the, the river is going to get a little bit more crowded, but okay. uh, it's not going to be. So you fly guys are out there and you're being surrounded by dudes using bait all, the whole time. Yeah. That being said. That, um, that sounds awesome, actually. That's a good challenge. It, it, it is. Pretty work. But the cool part about November is the weather turns. Mm-hmm. Um, typically in October, we get we get rain and stuff. But November, the weather can be quite gnarly. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, the river starts to, while it's going to get busy, um, it's not going to last long because once that weather turns, a lot of guys don't want to fish in sideways rain. And that's when I prefer to fish for steelhead is when it's raining sideways and everybody except me is miserable. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, those, those are the days though, that you can just catch a ton of, oh, fish. Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely hammer them. So that that's coming up, but also too, um, in November, we get a somewhat decent run of coho on the rogue. Mm. Um, so oh, we, cool. We, we catch those. Uh, we, we don't target those, but we, we get them every once in a while. And mm-hmm. uh, so that's, that's always, that's always a bonus, man. When you, when you get a silver coho and you know, that's yeah. just, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, man, we're just, uh, we're looking forward to more water, more fish. Um, I'm planning a uh, pyramid trip probably in February, late January, February, maybe. Um, I'm not sure yet. Well, if you don't invite me to that, I'm literally never going to talk to you again. Okay. I'll keep that in yeah. mind. Okay. Don't keep it in mind. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be driving through my state to get to. All right. So here's the deal. Let me just tell you why you need to. I have, I have this client that I've been guiding for a few years now. He's, he's a stick man, him and his cousin. Uh, Mark is like probably the most knowledgeable person about Lake Pyramid that I know. He lives in Reno. I mean, I, we got off the lower sack on, uh, on Thursday and we're driving from Reading to, to where I live about 35 minutes. All he did for 35 minutes was tell me every, just all these different things he's, and so we can get, I have Intel. What I'm trying to say is if you don't invite me, you don't have access to the Intel. Okay. Well, I'll let you know that I, uh, I talked to the owner of the Reno fly shop on a regular basis. Doesn't know anything. So <laughs> oh, he doesn't know anything. I was talking to uh, I was talking to Jim. Jim Liftfield is the owner of the Reno Fly Shop. Yeah. He texted me and he was like, "Hey, dude, I just got a new drift boat, um, but I like the mats you have, but they catch line. You know, do you, do you have any ideas?" I was driving another. I was like, "Dude, give me a call. I'm driving." So we talk about that and different ways to to do that. And he was like, "So how's the rogue fishing?" And I tell him, and I was like, "So how's pyramid fishing?" And he tells me, and he was like, "When you come into pyramid?" I was like, "It's actually in the back of my mind to come down after the first of the year." Yeah. And, uh, so I got, I, I got some Intel as well. Um, yeah. Pyramid Lake is an amazing place to fish, dude. It's like you're, it's the moon. It's the moon. It, it is. All right, actually, we need to do an episode of this podcast on Lake Pyramid. Cause you, you fished it. I fished it. It's crazy. It's just, it's like you're standing on Mars with a blue lake with just totally. <laughs> it is. It's the whole time you're there. If you're there when it's good, which means it's windy and terrible. It, Yes. You can't wait to leave. And as soon as you get in your car and you start leaving, it starts to like weigh on you. Like you can't wait to get back. It is the weirdest thing. So, so the first time I fished it with two buddies, dude, the wind kicked up to like 20 knots, not miles an hour. 20. Oh yeah. 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 We were like, we were like, dude, we are done. And that's when everybody started showing up and we got in the pickup. And totally. We're like, we're missing something. So we go running back down. And dude, we were we were into fish like I have never been into fish on still. It's water. crazy, yeah. It's like the worst. If that wind's blowing to you, it is like casting is hilarious, but it is like yeah. It's stupid. I've taken to a, I I take an eight weight switch rod and I use a five seventy five yeah. edge head to to yeah. cast on the big. Yeah, and it yeah. I, like- use, I generally I generally use a switch rod if I I can't I will I have a hard time sticking with the indicator even though I know that's like the most effective way to catch a lot of fish. 
I, but man, stripping in eight weight, um, I got this Orvos or Orvis, uh, Helios, uh, eight weight, man, throwing that with the sink tip, strip, strip, boom. Oh man. It's so fun, dude. Yeah. I was just, I was just talking to Mark though. Cause I want to go, um, he, he was kind of telling me the peak times, uh, but I want to go, I try to go twice a year. Just, it's so fun. It's great. It's great a, trip. It's just, it's a, such a unique fishery, dude. You, you can, yeah. if, you're having, Matt, if you don't enjoy your time at pyramid Lake, you need to talk to somebody. Cause they're so cool. Yeah, they yeah. should. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm also doing uh, I'm going to the Bahamas in March with Andrew. There's uh, I think a couple spots left for anybody who's interested in doing on a hosted, going on a hosted trip. So that'll be fun. Catch 10 billion bonefish. I'm hoping I can just get one chance to throw out a permit and then get schooled like always, but it'll be fun to have a good story. But yeah, Trinity though, for me, I'm, I'm still lower sack Trinity just, banging it out got some upper sack walk and wade trips coming up too for the october caddis in november uh because that's what they that's when they like to come out but uh yeah dude it's been 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 fun season though but so next episode uh we're going to be doing uh doing it on something maybe we'll do pyramid that, that'd be pretty that'd cool. be that'd be cool yeah we should plan that yeah. and do it from pyramid we if we do it though, there's a good chance we're going to be doing it in the truck just so we can hear ourselves talk. But yeah, with well, also with the heat on. Yes, because it's frigid. There. Yeah, we stayed. Uh, we got. I think it was the Pyramid Lodge. We we mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Kane and I went there last year, or I guess it'd been this year probably uh, earlier. But we stayed there. Uh, it was great. Great price. Uh, it was cool. It was fun. Uh, freezing cold, almost dying. But yeah, it was it was a good good time. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool, dude. Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I think with that, we can wrap it up. And uh, just wanted to say, if you're listening, we would love to encourage you to like, um, follow, share, you know, all of our stuff. Uh, Confluence Outfitters is on. We have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram account. We got a YouTube channel and we try to put uh, content up there on a regular basis. In fact, I got a Steve Scout River Report for the Rogue that will be going up tomorrow. Um and uh yeah we'd love to also have you leave a review too that will help us quite a bit so if you can go to the apple podcast store or wherever you get your podcast and leave a review for this podcast if you're enjoying it we would appreciate that and then we would love to get feedback on future topics uh if you have something you want us to talk about uh shoot us a message you can dm uh steve your ig is uh at steve scal fly fishing correct yes and that's where they can get a hold of you and learn about all the things that you're doing and accomplishing, correct? Yes. Yes, they can. I don't accomplish much. I do a lot, but I don't <clears throat> accomplish much. I feel like you ride your motorcycle in some pretty cool places, and I'm always like, huh, that looks fun. Yeah, I, I do do that. I do ride the Harley a lot. Um, well, now that the rain's coming, my wife won't let me take it out of the garage, something about crashing. but um, Probably smart. Yeah, no, but yeah, uh, I try to update it as much as I can. Um, so yeah, we're uh, at Steve Scout Fly Fishing. You are the at NorCal Trout Bum. NorCal Trout Bum, doing my thing. Yeah. Yeah, so hey, uh, if you also want to see what's going on on the fisheries that we guide on, you can go to confluenceoutfitters.com and you can see our river reports. Uh, we, we try to, I try to do one after every trip. doesn't always happen the day of the trip, but I try to i think steve you, you left the river report uh today i think right did yes the uh the yeah, weather perfect. started it. I, I felt like it would have been the same report for the last 10 weeks um so yeah, yeah. Now that we, low now, yeah low need water <laughs> yeah so now that we're getting some water um you know updated a bit and uh i've got a trip tomorrow and then i've got uh guys coming out that booked me for five days into this week oh, sweet. Uh, or next week so they'll be uh jeez they'll be they'll be a good one yeah and the cool part is is i was in the in the service with these guys we we're in the air force together so they're they're coming oh, out cool. um both big fly anglers but uh one of them's for colorado and he's uh oh cool He's Colorado fly guy and he's he a little called, trout. He's, yeah. Cause he was like, Hey dude, trout, I'm, yeah. I'm bringing my three weight. And I was like, just leave it in the closet. Yeah. That's like, if somebody called me and said, they're bringing the Tenkara, I would hang up the phone yeah. on him immediately. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I'm excited. He's never been after steelhead. We're going to do a, uh, going to do a day indicator fishing, a couple days of spay. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with an indicator day, but, uh, he's, uh, he's excited. I'm excited because it's going to be, 
and it's going to be proper steelhead weather while he's here, supposedly. Yeah, it's that's awesome. Days, and it's going to be good, and hopefully we get lots of fish. Yeah. Well, you know, I was just going to mention something that's cool is uh, I'm going to give a shout-out to – if you're on YouTube, if you, if you, you know, are into watching uh, videos on fly fishing, uh, my buddy named James uh, from About Trout. He's a pretty big YouTube channel. So, like, in YouTube world for fly fishing world – uh, he's got 10,000 plus subscribers. I feel like that's basically you're that's, like a rock star. Yeah. Right. I'd agree. Fly fishing world. Yeah. So anyway, he's, he's, uh, he's coming out to fish with me on the lower sack of the Trinity. So we'll have some video. I'm sure it'll be on the confluence page. And then I'm um, hopefully he puts something up on his YouTube channel too, uh, of us being out there trying to catch some Northern California fishes. Um, but yeah, it'd be kind of fun. So how many, yeah, how many dude. do we have? Like my mom, uh, your your family members, um, I don't even know. We not very oh, yeah. four hundred, fifty, five hundred. But we so had zero not, one time, bro. That okay. is true. We're not we're not rock stars yet. We're just we're still we're still playing J V, but we're getting varsity, right? We're we're yeah. city. Okay. Cool. We're trying. Y'all we're, need we're to spending try. time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, hey, thanks for listening. And uh if you like I said, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts. Uh, hit us up. I just thought of something about reading water that we should have said earlier, uh, which has to do with changing up your techniques. There's a lot of different types of fly fishing techniques that can be used. And all of the different types of water we mentioned have different techniques that can sometimes work better. We should have maybe do an episode on that at some point in time. Yeah, I was going to say that can be a whole episode on just techniques. Yeah, I would love to talk about Euro dorking and spay dorking in that episode. Let's do that. You talk about Euro Dorkin. Yeah. I'll talk about the proper way to catch steelhead spay fishing. And, uh, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> what you meant to say was the proper way to cast for steelhead. Say, you know, it's uh, tomato, tomato. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dude, I will end with this. Two yeah. years ago, my first steelhead trip, I got to do a scouting report or a trip. And I was like, this year, I'm not going to use my indicator rod for any steelhead. I'm going to, I'm going to just, when I go fishing, I'm going to throw, I'm going to swing flies. And I was like, already got to this run on the Trinity. It's my favorite run. I've caught so many fish in this one spot. I'm like, dude, I know they're there. And I grab my spay rod. I get the perfect tip on it. I tie on my favorite steelhead fly, which is an egg sucking leech. I tie it on first cast i throw it it is like the most beautiful snap tee i've ever made in my life get it swinging bam i hook an adult i land it and i'm like dude i am the man this is going to be the dopest year of all time and i did not touch a fish for another year and like three months (laughs) i thought i had it figured out though i was like I am a spay god. That's kind of what I thought. And then, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I've been in therapy ever since then. So you, yeah, that's basically what you need to know. Well, I hope it's working. All right. Yeah. All right, dude. Sign us out. Tell tell the people what they need to hear. All right, folks. Confluenceoutfitters.com. Book your guided trip. Any guide from the Sacramento River Delta to the Rogue River. We've got a fish species and a guide for you. After that, head over to Confluence Outfitters on Facebook, Instagram, and the YouTubes. Likes, follows on YouTubes. Hit that bell icon. That way you know when Luke puts out a video, he's putting out content all the time. Thanks for listening, folks, and we will catch you next time on the Confluence Podcast.